Yeah, so this is what it comes down to is the battlefield is in our mind. You know, the 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 conflict between our flesh and the Holy Spirit that Paul describes in Galatians 5.17 and the battlefield he, he describes it in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 you know when he says that we, though we walk in the flesh we don't war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Till the pulling down or the demolishing of strongholds and imaginations and every lofty thing. I mean, because anything that lifts itself up against the knowledge of God is arrogance and pride. And uh, that's where people miss it. And because the the this this false doctrine of no one's perfect and we're sinners is just nothing but arrogance against the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know that the writer of Hebrews talks about they trodden underfoot the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant that they're sanctified by calm and, un and unholy Hindu despite unto the spirit of grace. And, uh, I mean, because here he is saying, you know, anything that lifts itself up against the knowledge of God, you know, and bringing into captivity every thought, to the obedience of Christ. And once your obedience is full, you have a readiness to punish every disobedience once your obedience is full, as he describes in verse 6. You know, I mean, we got to see we got to see this the spiritual attack that we're under in our mind every day and because uh, it's there that we win or lose I mean he describes it in Romans 7 23 a law the law of sin in our flesh waging war against the law of our mind bringing it into captivity to the law of sin that's in our flesh. But it's the law of life and the spirit of Christ that made us, made our mind free from that law of sin and death. And he describes that in Romans 8 too. But as Romans 8 1 says in a legitimate translation that hadn't cut the last half of it off, says that there is therefore now no condemnation to, unto those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit which Galatians 5, 16, 17, and 18 agree with that because he says I say them walk in the spirit and you won't carry out the evil desires of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do what you will and he says, but those that are led of the Spirit are under no law. Man, they're under no condemnation. And that's what he's getting at in uh, Romans, uh, or I mean, Galatians chapter 3, when he says, for we were kept under the law until until the faith should come. 
you know, and so we under, it's until the faith comes and we live from faith unto faith. And, you know, and as long as we aren't, as long as we aren't allowing the flesh to have its way and we we make our flesh that daily sacrifice that he describes in Romans 12. You know, I call you near to listen. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices. I mean, we've got to understand by the mercies of God, the, the attitude in which we have to approach it. I mean, because... I mean, the writer of Hebrews describes it in chapter 5 concerning Jesus, who, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to as many as obey him. He says, Jesus, in the, in, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up, prayers with strong cries, with tears, and was heard, and that he feared. And, and you see that given in detail a little bit better with Luke in his account, I think maybe the 22nd chapter, the 22nd chapter, I think, you know, that he gives the account of Jesus going apart from the a few disciples that he took to the garden with him and said, wait, wait here and pray with me for one hour. You know, because, you know, another translation says, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in that same moment that he was in, so you can see him saying to them wait here apart from me and pray for one hour you know for the, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and he goes apart from them and and i think it's one gospel that says that he went apart from them like a stone cast away maybe like a hundred foot or something or whatever and uh says that he, in, in praying, that he sweated as it were great droplets of blood, that he was in such anguish from the temptation from the flesh. And, I mean, it's really important that we see this because of the, I mean, you, you got all these liars and deceivers, you know, talking about how that, you know, you don't have to come before God begging and all of this. And and God resists the proud. He gives his favor to the humble. And scripture says that Jesus, though he, he was heard and that he feared. I mean, so it says that when he prayed in the Gospel of Luke, when he gives his account, he says, Father, all things are possible with you. If, if it be possible, let this cut pass from me. He said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And, you know, when, when we're surrendering our will to God in the moment of the temptation. I mean, it's not a matter of willpower to us because we, when we entered into the faith and baptism, one, I mean, we were, we were believing with our whole heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And two, we we were willing to confess him as Lord, meaning that we were willing to surrender ourselves. And that is what the whole idea of being buried with him in baptism 
is about because we're surrend we're dying to self. And but as Paul said, we believe that you know even as Christ was risen from the dead by the power of God, we believe that by that miracle we are being our flesh is being quickened together with him. And that's why he's saying in 1 Corinthians 13, or I mean, 1 Corinthians 15, 36, that the body that we sow is not given life unless it dies. Because it is in that moment that we surrender our will to him. That's that conflict between the flesh and the spirit so that we cannot do what we will, he says, but those that, in the following verse, those that be led of the spirit are under no law. So, I mean, we need to see the, the revelation of that because in the moment of the trial or the temptation, it's not a matter of willpower. It's just a matter of our spiritual worship to God. And we are, as Paul says, bowing our knee unto God in Christ. Because as he describes that every time Every tongue shall confess him as Lord. Every knee shall bow. And that is what we are doing in this life. You know, when we do our spiritual worship to God, that, uh, you know, we don't bow our knee to anyone else. We bow our knee to to God in Christ. And our spiritual worship is, I'm surrendering my will for his will. You know, since we know that the law of sin that is in our flesh, and we're, when we're baptized, as he describes in Galatians 3.27, they were clothed with Christ. We we're putting on Christ, you know. And we're in reality, we're being sealed with the Holy Spirit when we pray and we, we call upon the name of the Lord. Because, as he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be at home in the body is to be absent from the Lord Jesus. But it's the Holy Spirit of promise that seals us. And that's why he describes it in Colossians 3, 3, that you free you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God, meaning in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, I mean, we got to see that... Uh, This is the faith that we're walking in when we're bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, and that's why he says in Romans 14, 23, that whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Because the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ from faith unto faith. And thus the just shall live by faith. And so... We're not, I mean, we got to get that. I mean, because in, in not do things outside of our faith, because our, our faith comes by hearing, but our hearing comes by the word God. And hearing is the only way that faith comes. And, and living faith, living faith comes by the word of God. And that's, why he's, that's what he's described in Colossians 2. He says, He who works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
and I'll let that one sink in there for a second, but does he do it by the hearing of faith? And you know that that It has to uh, has to do with hearing because we can't have faith without without hearing. We cannot have faith without hearing, and that hearing is by the word of God, and. That has everything that goes back to Mark 4 where he's saying you have an ear to hear take heed to what you hear for the measure you use to hear to listen it should be measured back to you and more ability shall be given unto you to hear and to understand you know and that goes back to the people of Berea in Acts 17 and then the children of Israel the writer is talking to in chapter 5 of Hebrews you know who had become dull of hearing the unwillingness to listen the laziness you know becoming complacent and uh, so bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And this, this battle in our mind, this, you know, this has to, more to do with discernment in our spiritual senses of our mind, as the writer of Hebrews describes in 5.14, when he's talking about but solid food belongs to those who are of full age who by reason of use and he just got through talking about the milk of the word have their senses trained to discern between good and evil and I mean and this goes back to uh, 1 Corinthians 13 he says for we as as babes in Christ, we prophesy in part and we know in part, but when that which is a full age has come, that which is in part shall be done away. Well, the, the Greek literally means to lose its usefulness, to to become unfruitful in our life, and, and meaning that it will have served its purpose, and we, and we move on when we come to, when we come to, when that which is a full age has come, well, because if you keep on reading there, he says, for when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And because he says, for now, as, as a babe in Christ, I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And I believe they had come to that face to face because he's describing in Second Corinthians chapter three, you know, now the in verses seventeen and eighteen when he says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. And we all with open open face meaning unveiled faces unlike Moses who had a veil over his face when he spoke to the children of Israel because they feared whenever he came out of the tent with the glory of God on his face so so that they could not steadfastly look to the end of the law was being which was being abolished and uh I mean you got to see that that is why the Lord appeared to them so that he they would fear him him even after seeing that fear they allowed the fear of the giants to to overcome even what they had seen at mount horeb there 
but you know so and and they entered not in because of that unbelief and and the scripture talks about them not entering in because of that unbelief because he's in psalms 95 he said he swore in his wrath that they should not enter my rest you know and the writer of hebrews is, is writing about that i think it's chapter uh, seven of hebrews you know where he said if joshua had given them rest he would have spoken of another day he says and he's talking about Jesus who went without the gate to suffer for us. And uh, telling, saying that, you know, let, let us therefore, since there remains a rest for the people of God, he says, let us go without the gate and suffer the reproach of the cross with him. You know, and I mean, we got to see... If we can see the revelation of the law having a form of the knowledge and of the truth that is in Jesus, Jesus being the, the fulfillment of that. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, uh, and, and remembering what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, when he said, henceforth, no, we know one after the flesh. And that has everything to do with the law. If we would be risen with Christ, seated at the right hand of God with him, I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not following the outward forms of the law. And that's where people get confused of this, you know, what Paul wrote in First Corinthians six twelve and ten twenty three is saying all things are lawful for me. And, you know he's not talking about anything goes. You know it just comes back to that. You know from faith unto faith, because the outward forms of the law is what we are not subject to, which in you, you see you see the description that he gives in in uh, Colossians 2 and the amplified really kind of expounds on that he says uh, when you were dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of your flesh God made you alive together with Christ having forgiven us all our sins having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands against us and which were hostile to us. And this certificate he has set aside completely removing by nailing it to the cross. Because you see uh, when Jesus in John 17 2 saying that the Father had given him authority over all flesh so that when he allowed sinful man to nail him to a tree, as it says in Deuteronomy, that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, that when he, when he allowed his sinless flesh to be nailed to the tree by sinful man to become the Passover lamb for us. And if you see, if you read Mark's account of the gospel, he 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 maps it out the passover lamb was offered between the evenings and and jesus was crucified when the rulers of the chief rulers of the jews handed him over to pilate it was 9 a.m the third hour and uh or actually it was before the third hour because by the at the break of dawn they brought him to pilate and by the ninth hour, or by the third hour, which was 9 a.m., he was nailed to the tree. He was crucified. And the scripture says from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is from noon until three o'clock, darkness was on the face of the earth. And it says that 
in the ninth hour that he gave up a strong cry and he gave up a spirit so he was dead by three o'clock in the afternoon and and uh, a councilman uh, one of the chief rulers of the Jews who was the scripture gives testimony that he was uh, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews uh, came and took courage and begged the body of Jesus and uh, uh, Nicodemus who who is spoken of in uh, chapter 3 of John of meeting with Jesus at, at night secretly uh, also was uh, was with Joseph in that and uh, you know so we, we need to see what it is that he done when he allowed himself to be crucified because he took the handwriting when his life was a fulfillment of the law having that's why he said not one jot or tittle shall be removed from the law until all things be accomplished or fulfilled and that's what he did was filled up what was lacking in the law and uh, he uh, he took it and nailed it to the tree you know that's it it why Paul was talking about in Romans 3.31 do we void the law through faith? certainly not yeah we establish it but obviously you see that in uh, Galatians and in Colossians that it's not to the outward forms of the law. It's to the righteous requirements of the law that he describes in Romans 8, 4. For he's, he says in verse 3, he says, For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the sinful flesh, God did accomplish by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful fl flesh and for sin condemns it in the flesh and verse four that the righteous requirements of the law may be carried out or fulfilled in those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit those re righteous requirements are fulfilled and love your neighbor as yourself those are the righteous requirements because that's what Jesus said. He said, love is the fulfillment or the filling up of the law. You know, because, you know, if we love our neighbor, we're not going to bear false testimony against him. If we love our neighbor, we're not going to covet his goods. If we love our neighbor, we're not going to uh, commit adultery with their spouse if we don't if we love our neighbor you know we're not going to do anything ill towards our neighbor so you know that the battlefield the battlefield is in our mind and it's more than just head knowledge i mean it's a spiritual it's a spiritual discernment that's why he describes in hebrews five fourteen for solid food belongs to those who are of full age who by reason of use of the milk of the word here we come back to that have their senses trained to discern between good and evil and it's it's that milk of the word and operating in the holy spirit and learning to function in the holy spirit and, and growing in the knowledge, experimental knowledge of God that uh, carries us on to full age. And we, we, we come to the, the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. 
In, in Ephesians 4.13, it says, Till we all come to the unity of the, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. But, you know, that is not accurate because it's the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. And uh, I don't... You know, with the way that they've changed the Word of God, you know, the unity of the faith is in the knowledge of the Son of God. It's not the unity of the faith and of the Son of God because they're not two separate things because, you know, all the scripture that I've shown on the knowledge of the, knowledge of the truth and obedience, you know, uh, when your obedience is full, having a readiness to punish every disobedience, when your obedience is full, that's talking about that full knowledge. And it's not, you know, the two aren't separate. The fa Our faith increases to the knowledge of the Son of God, you know. And Peter describes that grace and peace be multiplied to you in the in the knowledge of the God and of the Son in uh second Peter chapter two uh ver or chapter one verse two and you know so man let us uh it it's a it's a matter of and it's the word of God it's the word of God that works this and the writer of Hebrews describes the word of God on this on this point in chapter 4 verse 12 when he says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder the soul and spirit and that's the same as saying distinguishing between soul and spirit he said and joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I mean, because this is the discernment between good and evil because of the law of sin that's in our flesh. And, you know, the spiritual, the spiritual attacks that we go through from, from Satan and his angels every day. And, you know, people that don't think, people think that they walk around if, if they could just, if God could just open their eyes for 30 seconds, for five seconds, <laughs> to let them see what's going on in the unseen, you know, they, they could see what it is that I'm talking about. Because, I mean... Satan has done well on getting people to naturalize everything and to get people to think that, you know, Satan, Satan isn't there attacking you constantly. And that's, that's not true. I mean, that is not true. Satan, if, if, if a person isn't already in bondage, you know, just like Jesus, he, he is constantly looking for a more opportune time to bring you into bondage. You know, so we need to, we need to see that truth because it is, You know, we're talking, we're talking being able to discern in our mind good and evil, and it's not just, it's not just head knowledge. We're talking discernment, not just knowing about something. And uh, you know, even when we know about something, we can be trying to convey a truth to someone. And be going un undergoing a spiritual attack to keep to try to hinder us from conveying a truth to someone else so that they 
can walk in the liberty that is in Christ because that truth isn't being taught today in these buildings that are named in the name of Christ. You know, they're teaching a bunch of heresies, you know, is all they're teaching because they're not, they're not teaching the gospel that was handed down to us by the apostles and then, and to those who love not their life unto the death. And, uh, you know, so we just need to understand it's not just about head knowledge. You know, it is, it is about discern the senses of our mind, the spiritual senses of our mind. I mean, because it is in our mind, we, we stand or fall and the, and the law of life that's in the spirit of Christ has freed our mind from the law of sin and death that's in our flesh. And we've been lifted and, and we're seated with Christ. That's the faith that we walk by. That's to show our position, you know, over evil. But there's still a spiritual warfare. There's still a spiritual warfare. And we need, we need to be aware of that. And I mean, I know, I know I am. I mean, because, you know, I've been trying to convey this truth and, Praying, God, give me, give me the wisdom to can put it into words and connect, to connect these scriptures that were written by the apostles. To to convey that truth to others, you know. And I'm gonna I'm gonna end it at that, and. Uh, Hopefully I've done hopefully I've done well enough to to convey the truth enough to help someone.